One of the first things that I try to do when I meet someone is to learn their history. Without being overly eager, I would want to ask somebody questions about where they grew up, what their family was like, what big events impacted them. Because once I know their story, I can understand them a whole lot better and I can connect with them more. I can even know how to love them better once I understand where they're coming from. We're at the beginning of this series of talks that we're calling Dear Church. We're going to be talking about the book of Acts, which is the history of the founding of the Christian church. And I hope it helps you understand, connect with, and even love the church better. For those of us who are part of church, I hope it inspires us and focuses us by reminding us who we are. For those who might be checking church out, I hope it clarifies a little bit more what church is and what it isn't. So here's one of those founding stories that's important for us to look at from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3 says this, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then, walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Pretty amazing story. Just a chapter earlier, we saw the miracle take place in Acts chapter 2 of the Holy Spirit being poured out on this group of 120 Christ followers gathered in an upper room, a second story room. There's the sound and the visuals that take place and then there's the miraculous gift of other languages that eventually leads this 120 people to, uh, to bring revi a revival service to the streets of Jerusalem where 5,000 people repent and, and believe the good news about who Jesus is and how God raised him from the dead. Now, something to note. We never hear about the upper room again. What a significant place. Probably the place where the Last Supper took, took place, where Jesus broke bread with his disciples, and then the place where they were meeting together, waiting on the promised Holy Spirit, and there's this outpouring, this great miracle, but we never hear about the upper room again. So here's an important thing to note, the first thing I wanna, I wanna talk about today. Church is not a monument, it's a movement. We don't hear about the upper room, there are no tickets sold to sightsee. There's not even a plaque to say it all happened here, it all started here. We never hear mention of this place again in the book of Acts or anywhere else because even though it's our proclivity maybe to put a stake in the ground and say, hey, let's just stay here. This is such an amazing place. Let's build a monument. God had more to accomplish. The whole book of Acts is movement. It isn't about just one place. It goes from Jerusalem on to Judea and Samaria, and then through all parts of the known world. It touches on Asia and, and North Africa, eventually Europe and beyond. It isn't even focused on one person. It starts with the, that original group of Christ followers, Peter, and then Stephen, and then Barnabas, and then Paul. So this is the thing. This is all about movement, not monuments. That's why we don't hear about the upper room again. Acts 3 says Peter and John after experiencing this powerful encounter with God, are still trying to understand what it all means, but then they go back to the temple to take part in daily prayers. Peter and John go back to their regular schedule. <laughs> and so I want you to see this. This is the second thing. God's touch on our lives transforms the ordinary. 
God's work is not to snatch us away from our everyday lives into some other detached, blissful state of ignorance. That's not what church is about. It's not an escape from our everyday. What God's intention is, is to invest our everyday lives with the power to live for Him and to love as He loves. It it makes us better spouses. It, It makes us better employees. It makes us better friends because it gives us the power to react to people and to situations in a godly way. That's what the miracle of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was for. It was so that you and I could live for God in our everyday lives. Pastor Mark Batterson says it like this. He says, he says it in a way that I love. He says, it's easier to act like a Christian than to react like a Christian. Because we know that when we when we got when we're able to plan ahead, we can act like a Christian. But we but when we're faced with unexpected circumstances in our everyday, we have to react like a Christian. God's touch on our lives is the key to reacting to the everyday opportunities and challenges that we face in a godly way. Peter and John have undoubtedly seen this man before. Remember, he was begging every day at that gate for a long time, but only now they've been touched by God. They're gonna react differently to this thing they've encountered every day. This man is asking for something that he needs, but Peter and John are gonna give him something that he doesn't know that he needs. That's a picture of the church's ministry in our everyday. We are responding to people's everyday needs, but we're doing it in a way that points them to an even deeper need that they have for God. That's what Peter and John say to the man. Hey. You're asking us for silver and gold, but we have something that you don't even know to ask for. I want to point out something pretty obvious, but also very important. This man is not able to walk, which means that even if he had wanted to, he couldn't have experienced the miracle in the upper room because his legs couldn't have taken him there. So God sends Peter and John to bring the upper room miracle to this man. You see. God's miracles, this is the last thing I want you to see, God's miracles are always aimed beyond us. Whatever blessing God is working in your life, whatever miracle God is doing in the church, it's almost always and certainly aimed beyond us. It's meant for a purpose that is greater than you and than me. Sure, God is going to bless you and me, but it's so that you and I can be a blessing. What God does in this man's life is going to be a powerful testimony in the whole city. And it's all because Peter and John are willing to take what God had done in that upper room and bring it with them into their every day. I pray the same for you.